All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Thursday, September 30th, uh, 2021, and we are live. So if you listen to my show, you watch my broadcast, you've heard me talk about uh, a new 10-week uh, online course that we have uh, starting up. And this one is Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, What They Didn't Teach You in School. So I wanted to uh, come on and do a brief overview of this 10-week online course and what it covers. And we deal with thousands of years of history and we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. OK, so uh, class number one starts up Sunday, October 3rd, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this is a this is a fantastic class. You're going to learn a lot in it. You can visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com to register for uh, the 10-week online course. We do the class live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it uh, whenever you want to. All right. So we see stories. And if you watch my show, we see stories dealing with history and the attacks on teaching um, the history of uh, slavery, African-American history, uh, dealing with race uh, study uh, classes, dealing with racism or subjects dealing with racism. We see these attacks on this type of information taking place in various school districts across the country. A lot of times this gets uh, labeled as uh, critical race theory, but it's not critical race theory. Critical race theory is a uh, legal analysis and is basically taught in law school and graduate school, things like this. One of the latest examples of this attack is, uh, this is piece here from uh, CNN uh, that deals with uh, out of Tennessee, okay? And uh, Tennessee parents, uh, say some books, uh, Tennessee parents say some books uh, make students feel uh, uh, discomfort because they're white. They say a new law backs them up. All right. And you have um, th th this movement to shut down different uh, teachings about the civil rights movement, uh, different things like this, and claiming that it makes uh, white students feel uncomfortable. All right. Then you have um, this story here. Uh, this other one. This is one that I've talked about before. This is a study from uh, this was a poll that was taken from uh, USA Today Ipsos. And this one talks about how over 60 percent, actually 63 percent of Americans want children to learn the legacy of slavery. OK. And it deals with uh, it, it deals with a uh, majority of Americans say they are in favor of their children learning about the legacy of slavery and the ongoing effects of racism in the United States. Uh, according to this poll, 63 percent of Americans polled say they are in favor of their children uh, learning about the lasting effects of racism and slavery in, in the country. And you have a, a, a small but very vocal minority that shows up to school board meetings that are taking over school boards, things like this, pushing another agenda. OK, uh, and if we look at let's see one more article here. These are just some recent articles. Uh, the, you know, I do research every day and prepare topics for uh, our show. I'm on six days a week, the African History Network show. I monitor about 35 different news sources on a daily basis. This one here is from September 29th, 2021. A pro-slavery petition is the latest racist incident at this Kansas City school. Parents say they've had enough. And this was an online petition some students started circulating to reinstate slavery, to reinstate slavery. So we're at a pivotal time in history where you have some people of various races who want the real history taught. And then you have other people largely white. You have other people largely white who are focusing on shutting down these conversations dealing with the history. 
don't want the history taught and they and and they use the disguise that they're afraid it will make white students feel guilty about being white but i haven't seen any white students say they feel guilty about learning about this history i've heard now what i think is happening is some white parents feel guilty of have some guilt about what's happened in history and about being white maybe what their ancestors have done maybe what their great grandfather did or something like that okay so this is the environment that all this is taking place within so i want to look here at the um uh let's look here at the uh, powerpoint presentation because in the class i do a powerpoint presentation we have um articles book references uh video clips guest speakers there's a ton of information here and also this was a uh, this was a recent article as well from june of uh 29 of uh, 2021 june of 2021 60 percent of americans know little or nothing about juneteenth 60 percent of americans know little or nothing about juneteenth okay and this is from uh new york times now if they know little or nothing about juneteenth then what do you think they really know about the history of slavery and this ties into Juneteenth. This ties into the Tulsa Race Massacre being made a day of remembrance, June 1st, 1921, which it should be. It should be. And, and what this does, making Juneteenth a federal holiday and um, also uh, the Tulsa Race Massacre being the day of remembrance, what this does is this forces a conversation, a national conversation about a history that many republicans and state legislatures are passing laws to shut down the teaching of that history so this is extreme this is extremely important because americans are very ignorant of history and we have to learn this history one to keep uh, history from repeating itself and also understand how we got to where we are this is one of my teachers dr Leonard jeffries he was just here in Detroit um, Sunday. I was with him Sunday at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. So here's some of the things that we deal with in the online course. We deal with ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, ancient Africa, Nubia, Ethiopia. Uh, we deal with Ghana, Songhai, Mali. We take you throughout history, do a, a chronology of history and uh, leading up to the transatlantic slave trade. We also deal with the African presence. Um, in the Americas going back tens of thousands of years. So a lot of people ask who was Imhotep? I just got that question this past weekend. A lot of people ask the question, who was Imhotep? So Imhotep was one of the greatest people who ever lived in human history. Uh, the word Imhotep means he who comes in peace in the ancient Middle Nether language, uh, the language of the ancient Egyptians or the ancient Kemites, the Greeks call it the hieroglyphics. He was a high priest. He was a physician, architect, mathematician, designer of the Step Pyramid for Pharaoh Zosier and the Subiti Zosier in the Third Dynasty. He was known as the world's first multi genius. He was known as the world's first multi genius. OK, now here are some famous um, uh, little statues of Imhotep as well. All right. And if you read the book, um, by Dr. Malefic Ketia Santi. There are a number of books that we use in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in the class or anything like this, but the, the books that we use for reference. Um, there's one from Dr. Malefic Ketia Santi. This one right here, who's the chair of the uh, Afro-American Studies Department at Temple University in uh, Philadelphia. The Egyptian Philosophers, Ancient African Voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten. The Egyptian philosophers, uh, ancient African voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten. Okay, but Dr. Malefic Ketia So this is this is before Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, uh, uh, all these Greek philosophers who were supposed to be so heavy. This deals with th this deals with these African philosophers: Patahotep, uh, Kunanup, Kagimni, Sanchi. This deal this deals with these African philosophers. All right, so this is Imhotep. And this is not Imhotep. In the 2001 uh, movie, The Mummy Returns, which was the sequel to The Mummy, the villain's name was Imhotep. 
Consequently, many of our children think that one of our greatest ancestors was evil and not of African descent. And this is uh, one of the reasons why we have to be so careful of the type of information that um, um, our children take in through the media. Okay, this is why we have to be so careful of the uh, type of information our children take in uh, through the media, because they they have this actor uh, Arnold Vosloo was his name portraying M. Hotep, who is a high priest in the movie is a high priest, but he's also a villain. And they have this Eurasian looking uh, person portraying M. Hotep, which then gives the impression that M. Hotep was not African, which then buys into this whitewashing of the history of ancient Kemet that the ancient Egyptians, the ancient, ancient Kemites were Europeans, or as some have push forth a notion brown skin caucasians anything but african anything but black african okay so uh and this is a, a picture of the step pyramid at um uh, saqqara that imhotep was the architect of for um uh, pharaoh zosier and the subiti zosier so we deal with asar offset and heru who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And we take you through our history. We look at these, uh, some of the art, we look at some of the deities, all this information. And uh, this is the, uh, they, they were known as the first Holy Trinity. Oset gives birth to the baby Heru on December 25th, Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth. Um, Oset was the wife of Osar, who the Greeks called Osiris. Mother of Heru, the, the first Kairest or Christ, because Christ comes from the Greek word Christos in, in, in Christ and Christos means anointed or it can mean anointed one. But that comes from the Medunetter Kairest, Ka meaning spirit, rest meaning to rise, the rising of the spirit, the Kairest. And, you, you know, one of the things we do is we look at some of the origins of, of Christianity. We go throughout history, look at some of the origins of Christianity. We look at things like... Uh, Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson. Uh, we look at the origins of uh, Christmas, okay, which takes you right back to ancient Kemet as well and takes you back to Rome and the festival of Saturnalia. Um, and uh, Osset helps to resurrect Asar after he's killed by uh, his brother, well, after he's killed by his brother Set, okay. Um, Heru helps to resurrect Asar, but Osset gathers the pieces of Asar's body. Asar is cut up into 14 pieces by his uh, brother Set. And Osset, the wife, recovers 13 of those pieces. The, the, the one that's missing is the phallus, the penis. And she's going to, uh, in the mythology, erect the uh, Tekken, okay, erect the Tekken, which is... Uh, a symbol of resurrection, okay? A symbol of resurrection to represent that last piece that was not recovered. Um, Osset means she of throne and she's associated with love and fertility. And when we look at all these deities, even when we look at, uh, we, we, we're we gonna see how the, the netter or the deities from ancient Kemet are going to influence the uh, deities from the Greeks and the Romans. These are basically the, the 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 deities from the Greeks and the Romans are basically copies. Um, even when you look at Zeus, who they said was the king of the gods, Zeus is uh, said to be from Ethiopia. Zeus is said to in, in Greek mythology, they tell you that Zeus originated from Ethiopia. All right. And then when we look at the uh, when we go throughout Europe, we're going to see the worship of the black Madonna and child. Okay. Uh, and statues of the black Madonna and child. And they still have these statues in Europe, in Poland, in France, in Russia, Italy, Spain, they still have these statues today. And this was even before, uh, the Moors go in in seven eleven AD, even before that, these Europeans are worshiping the black Madonna and child. 
if we look at uh, this book here, this is another book that I reference in the course of uh, Black Star, the African Presence in Early Europe by Renoko Rashidi. We know Renoko just passed away. Renoko was a friend of mine. I interviewed him a number of times. But uh, this deals with the uh, the African presence of the Moors uh, in the medieval times in Europe. But on page 90 and 91, especially page 90, just to give you an example, he has pictures of statues of Black Madonnas, the Black Madonna child in Europe, okay? These Europeans were worshiping African. These Europeans were worshiping African people. Uh, you have it in uh, Switzerland. You have it in uh, Poland, um, Madrid, Spain, and Luxembourg. Uh, Luxembourg. Okay. And then this right here. This is the national flag of Sardinia. Okay, uh, which is an Italian island. The national flag of Sardinia. They have African Moors heads on their national flag because the Moors were in those areas and it was a, it took a monumental effort to conquer them. And originally the, 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 uh, originally you, th those, the, the headband, the bandana is originally going to be a blindfold to signify that they have been captured and they were prisoners, but because of, to be po politically correct. And because of, uh, um, tourism and things like this, they changed the blindfold to a bandana. But that shows the, the presence uh, of the Moors. That's just one of the numerous examples of the presence in the Moors. You can look at the coat of arms. You can look at the flags, things like this. OK, and then we go from. Uh, all set. Um, the wife of Asar, who gives birth to Heru. We, we, we go from that to the Black Madonna and Child. And then we go from the Black Madonna and Child to the decolorized version. Of the, of the white Mary and, and Jesus. And as you have a rise in European powers coming out of the dark ages and uh, the late 1400s going into the 1500s, as you have a rise of European powers, what's going to happen is you're going to have a rise in the dominance of European phenotypes. And you're going to have um, a lot of these uh, historic or um, mythological figures a lot of these figures from mythology or what have you, you're going to have a lot of these figures that are going to be reinterpreted as European. So Michelangelo paints the Sistine Chapel and he uses his um, relatives as the models of Adam and Eve and, and of God and depicts them as being Europeans. Uh, we talk about, you, you know, some of the Netaru in uh, ancient Kemet and, and we're going to see these uh, versions of these in, uh, amongst the Greeks and the Romans, but Ma'at, Ma'at, who was a winged deity with a uh, feather in their headband. Ma'at was the personification of truth, justice, righteousness, balance, harmony, order, and reciprocity. Uh, we talk about the uh, 42 laws of Ma'at, or the, uh, and th that, which is a precursor to the 10 commandments uh, as well. So this is just a few of the things that we talk about now. This right here shows the theft of the culture. Um, when I was uh, in 1970s, I remember the Shazam and ISIS hour. They used to come on um, CBS, used to come on CBS 11, 8, 11 a.m. Saturday morning. And it was a live action show. Shazam had a half hour show. ISIS had a half hour show. And with the superhero or the superheroine Isis, they said that she got her powers from ancient Egypt. But they didn't say that ancient Egyptians were African people. And this was this white woman who got her powers from ancient Egypt. And they, they're taking symbols, the, the sun disc of Ra in, in the, the, the horns of uh, uh, Het Heru, et cetera. And even at the beginning of the show, when they have the, the when the opening of the show and the theme song, all this stuff, they, they, they talk about the names of deities of Netter from ancient Kemet. And they talk about her getting her where she gets her powers from. But they ain't say that these were African, that, that the ancient Kemetic people were African people. So they just. You know, ran this game on us and it made us think, oh. This this 
plays into this myth that the Egyptians were white. Um, this is Dr. David M. Hotep. He wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. He's a friend of mine. I've interviewed him, I, don't, I think, 14, 15 times, something like that. Um, his book came out in 2011. His new book just came out this year, 2021, The First Americans Were Africans, uh, revised. So I need to bring him back on the show. But his book deals with the African presence in the Americas dating back tens of thousands of years. And one of the things that we do is we look at uh, archaeological discoveries, groundbreaking archaeological discoveries that are causing people to totally rethink everything and causing the scientists, the paleontologists rethink everything. Um, the, page 14 of his book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence. He talks about evidence of an African presence 51,700 years ago found in a campsite in Allendale County, South Carolina, um, discovered by archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear. OK, now this this discovery was in 2004, 2004. I'm going to show you a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear here in just a minute. All right. How's everybody doing? Uh, do me a favor, share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. If you like this information, give us a thumbs up. OK a thumbs up or a heart or a like whatever it is um and then be sure to register for this 10-week online course class number one starts up sunday uh october 3rd 2021 uh the class is regularly 130 dollars is on sale 80 dollars. we do the sessions live all the sessions are recorded you can go back and watch them anytime there's bonus content that you'll get as well and even after the 10-week course is over with you could go back and watch the entire course you have access to it you can uh, so next year if you want to go watch the entire 10-week course again you can do that not a problem all right uh so class is going to be 12 noon to 2 p.m eastern standard time we do 10 consecutive sundays and um we go through and look at thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place and we go through and analyze the transatlantic slave trade uh, and then there's a second 10 week online course that I teach that focuses on history from 1865 uh, with the end of the Civil War through 1968. OK, that class is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. But if we look here at what uh, they, they found at this uh, campsite, they found 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in this country from uh, that dates back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, uh, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics. Uh, they found linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. All right. So we're going to go through and look at a number of different archaeological discoveries. OK, that just are blowing um, everybody's minds. New new discoveries are coming out every other week. And when you when you read about these, they tell you that it's causing uh, everybody to rethink everything is causing the scientists and archaeologists and and paleontologists etc is causing them to rethink everything and they keep having to push the timelines back okay um you remember uh juvenile had the song back that thing up like 1999 98 99 when these new discoveries keep coming out they keep having to back that thing up they keep having to push the timelines back this article is from November 18, 2004, from ScienceDaily.com. They talk about the discovery from Dr. Albert Goodyear. And the name of this article, uh, uh, name of this article is New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Now, you'll find when, when the other thing is really, really important. When these discoveries take place, and I go look at them in different news sources, uh, all the news outlets carry them okay all the news outlets carry these these discoveries but you you 
if they play if they talk about it maybe on msnbc it may be for 30 seconds but all the outlets washington post new york times national geographic um usa today cnn nbc they all have stories about it you can go research this but this one right here says radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains now, now this is a summary of the article and this is not my summary this is the summary from sciencedaily.com which is a scientific website they have scientific discoveries there and archaeological discoveries etc it says radio tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last may along the savannah river in allendale county by university of south carolina archaeologist dr albert goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old or at least 50,000 years old meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age okay now that's not me saying this all right now this is before Native Americans came into existence this is before white people existed on the face of this earth okay this 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 was the Khoisan who have the oldest DNA DNA on the planet they come from southern Africa they the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. It went all around the world and they were here. Um, so one of the reasons why this information is so important is because we, we, we've been continually told that African people first came to this land conquered and shackled in chains and, and first came here in 1619 or if you get somebody who knows more about history, they'll say, oh, OK, 1526, when the Spanish were taking Africans into the territory we call South Carolina. OK, and then after a few weeks, they're going to there's going to be a revolt and they overthrow their oppressors because the Spanish was trying to set up um, a colony there in South Carolina. Now, this is 93 years before 1619 in Jamestown, Virginia. OK, or if you have somebody then knows more than that they'll say well juan garrido uh, came into florida with the spanish conquistador juan ponce de leon in 1513 which is true that's true juan garrido was born about 1480 in west africa that's true um he's probably probably the first person of african descent we know of by name that came to this land that we call the united states of america probably the first one we know of by name this this article here from june 4th 2021 africa's oldest ethnic group fights to keep ancestral land from amazon from amazon reach okay and this is about the khoisan all right um that's a khoisan uh a khoisan man there uh amazon's new african headquarters see if we can zoom in on this amazon's new african headquarters will be built on land ancestrally owned by the uh by the people thought to be the longest existing ethnic group the longest existing ethnic group in the world the khoisan okay amazon is looking to build its uh new african headquarters in cape town south africa in a project that will take between three and five years However, the land on which the multi-billion dollar corporation seeks to put its edifice belongs to the local Khoisan people, reputed to be the oldest existing people in the world. Since the project was announced a few years ago, ago Khoisan uh, people aided by conservationists have appealed to have the project rejected because of the sensitive matter of Khoisan culture. What ensued was a clash of ideas to respect the traditions and identity of a people or to give away to the ambitions of one of the most prosperous businesses ever founded. OK, you can read the, we, we can read the rest of this article here. Uh, face to face Africa dot com is a lot of really, really good articles here. If you watch my show, we you know. Uh, we share some articles in, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. We share uh, articles from face-to-faceafrica.com. But this is talking about the Khoisan. Okay. So 
let's continue here. And and there was um there was a really really good discovery that came out because I read a lot of these articles here, and we've been I've been teaching this class for going back to 2017, and I incorporate more of the archaeological discoveries uh, as they uh, come out. There was um there was this one here from um, uh, June of 2017, I think it was. And this one deals with uh, Morocco. This deals with a discovery that was flipping the archeological world upside down. This dealt with a discovery in Morocco uh, where they found um, homo sapien uh, remains of homo sapiens, modern man that date back between 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. Um, let me, let me say this. I may say some things that outside the circumference of your own awareness, probably should have said this at the beginning. I may say some things that are outside the circumference of your own awareness, just because you never heard them before, disagree with them or don't, don't like them. Don't like them does not mean that they're not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that's outside of the circumference of your own awareness. I learned this from one of my teachers, Dr. Ray Hagens. Okay. Just because you know everything that you know about what you know does not mean you know everything there is to know about what you know. There's still things to know that exist outside of the circumference of your own awareness. So if we look at, for instance, this, um, if we look at this one here from um, NBC News and Washington Post, New York Times, they all had stories on this one. This one blew people away. So if you think that the world is like only 6,000 years old because Bishop James Usher in 17th century common era AD said creation started 4004 BC, No, no, we're older than we thought. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years ago. New find put pushes or human origin back 100,000 years ago. Okay. And this was a discovery made in Morocco. This article came out June 17, 2017. Modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought researchers reported on Thursday, um, on, on Wednesday, June of 2017. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show how they show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago. This is 100,000 years earlier than scientists have believed until now. This 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 discovery here just blew everything out the water because the oldest remains they had of Homo sapiens date back about one hundred and ninety five thousand years ago in Ethiopia. This discovery here blew that out the water about one hundred thousand years. The new site near Morocco's coast in the city of Makarek has always yielded interested interesting human remains. New discoveries and new dating methods show that in fact many of the bones belong to modern homo sapiens and they lived as far back as 300,000 or 350,000 years ago as far back as 300,000 350,000 years ago the earliest previous homo sapiens homo sapiens bones date back 195,000 years ago in their clear and they're from clear across the continent in modern day Ethiopia, which shows that we were migrating out of East Africa er earlier than originally thought. Taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. OK, um, read the rest of this. This is a deep article. And they, and they have uh, the journal Nature has a lot of these archaeological discoveries uh, and and then all the news outlets will pick them up from the like the journal nature uh let me see here okay three hundred thousand three hundred 
Um, this is the latest find that rewrites the history of early humans. Earlier this year, a team argued they have found evidence that either modern humans or pre-humans were in North America 150,000 years ago. That was a discovery in California dealing with the Macedon skeletons. And they're saying that these Macedon skeletons were broken by humans and that these skeletons date back 130,000 years ago. And if that's correct, that puts humans in the California area 130,000 years ago. That's the discovery that they're talking about. It, 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 rather than that area, 130,000 130, years or maybe even before then. That's the discovery they're talking about. And when 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 the when this article came out and the one dealing with humans being in possibly California, at least 130,000 years ago, I sent those articles to Dr. David M. Hotel. Because we know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen as well. I'm going to show you an archaeological discovery that deals with this. OK, how's everybody doing? How you all like this type of information? OK, let's keep going here. Um, all right. So, Dr. Albert Goodyear, this discovery here. Now, this is a discovery that uh, with the, the, Dr. David M. Hotel was interviewed by WKRP in Cincinnati Channel 5 back in 2011. And then also uh, in his book, he talks about this discovery. This is from the New York Times. February 2010. The name of this article was uh, on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. This is from February 15th, 2010, New York Times. New evidence on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. And Crete is a Greek island. Stone tools. They did, what happened was they did excavations for two summers on the Greek island of Crete. They found stone tools that archaeologists say are at least 130,000 years old. Stone tools that archaeologists say are at least 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human of pre cultures. Now, Crete has been an island for more than five million years in the Mediterranean, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years. Specialists in Stone Age archaeology, uh, St Stone Age archaeology say previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus and a few other Greek islands and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. So, but what they're saying is like, wait a second. If this, if they're saying, wait a second, this, this pushes that timeline back and Africans were sailing 130,000 years ago. This is why I say we know at least 130,000 years of our history has been stolen. This discovery here just caused them to have to rethink everything and push the timelines back. Now, this is another discovery here. This one was revealed in 2013. They had done the excavation and everything before then, but this was revealed 2013. This is about Tanis Heraklion. Tanis Heraklion was the lost city of Egypt that was swallowed into the sea. OK, Tanis Heraklion. This is an article here from uh, Yahoo News they, that they picked up from the Telegraph, which is a, a, a UK uh, a newspaper. The Telegraph reports that 150 feet beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir, they found 64 ships, 16 foot tall statues, 700 anchors, countless gold coins and smaller artifacts. Now, the archaeologist uh, Frank Gadillo was the one who headed up this, this excavation. He estimates that Thomas Heraklion was built around 8th century BC. Now, this is 
uh, some pictures of what they found. I have some video that they shot of them underwater. Uh, and they have these artifacts there, but these are some still pictures of, uh, of some of the statues they found and what they were able to find, uh, and what they brought to surface also. This is the legs of a statue that's broken off. That is from uh, the, the horns, uh, the, the, the horns and sun disc is probably uh, offset, either that or Het Heru. The sun disc of Ra and the horns. Uh, when I talked about the Tekken a few minutes ago, so we see the Tekken, and, and Egypt on the Potomac is a fantastic book that uh, Tony Browder wrote. So we, we use that book in the class as well, as well as Nile Valley, as well as Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, which I have around here somewhere. Um, so Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, fantastic book. And then also uh, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder as well, which deals with how the layout of Washington, D.C. is a copy of the layout of ancient Egypt. OK, and it deals with a lot of the secrets in the layout of Washington, D.C., et cetera. Um, that city is called Thomas Heraklion. Somebody asked the question, what's the name of that city again? But when we look at the Washington Monument and this ties into Freemasonry. In the origins of Freemasonry coming from um, the teachings coming from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Um, the Washington Monument is a Tekken. We know uh, George Washington was a Freemason, but the Tekken being a symbol of resurrection coming from the mythology of Asar, Aset, and Heru, there are about 1,200 Tekkenu, Tekkenu for plural, about 1,200 Tekkenu throughout ancient Kemet, historically the day there, uh, somewhere between seven to 12. OK, um, when we look at Freemasonry, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and son. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun. Um, it, it's a metaphor for this uh, for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was, in, was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. Okay, light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So the concept of getting your credentials when you go to college and you get your credentials you get an associate's degree bachelor's degree master's degree phd the uh the concept of getting those um uh, credentials in a series of degrees okay comes out of ancient kemet and we, we also see the uh concept of the liberal arts coming out of ancient Kemet as well. Um, George G.M. James and Stolen Legacy talks about the seven liberal arts, the arithmetic and the logic and the rhetoric, things like this. Um, it, it, uh, Stolen Legacy, okay, is a, is, a very, is a very, very good book by George G.M. James. So we see all this trace back, traces back to ancient Africa. Uh, if you read pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac, uh, Browder breaks this down. Now, 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence uh, were Freemasons, and 13 of the 39 signers of the U.S. Constitution were Freemasons also. So some other things that we deal with in the class, we, we take you, we do a, go through a timeline of history, starting in ancient Africa, we do ancient Kemet, and Nubia, Ta-Nehisi, all that, Ethiopia. We go throughout history up to and including the transatlantic slave trade. So some of the things we deal with in the classes, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events leading to the transatlantic slave trade starting to understand this? Like the, um, uh, whether you talk about uh, 1441 uh, and Tom Gonsalves, um, 
going into Mauritania, capturing some Africans. This is looked at as the beginning of the transatlantic slave trade. You look at um, the, the Moors starting to lose more starting to lose control, especially in Spain. Um, you look at uh, Europe coming out of the Dark Ages. Um, it's, 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 there's a number of things that we see leading to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. Uh, what, what role did Christopher Columbus play? Because Columbus helps to helps the transatlantic slave trade to spread. He helps lay the foundation for racism, slavery, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people. So we go through and look at Columbus and his four voyages. Um, and today, you know, in the recent, in the past few months, we've heard um, Haiti in the news. We've heard Cuba in the news and Jamaica. Okay. These are all three, uh, Cuba, Haiti, and Jamaica are all three uh, countries, islands that Columbus conquered uh, little, uh, about 529, almost 530 years ago or so. Um, Hispaniola, the island of Hispaniola where Haiti is, 1492, Cuba, 1492, Jamaica, 1494. So we're still feeling the effects and, and Columbus, he didn't just do this on his own. This was on behalf of the Spanish crown, King, uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. So we're still feeling the effects 500 years later of Spain conquering um, these islands. What role did Christopher Columbus play? When did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We deal with that complicated history because it's not really like the way the dominant narrative has been told. Were African people in America before the, the transatlantic slave trade? Absolutely. We were I mean, African people are the original Americans. This is why Dr. David M. Hotel's book is so important. Uh, we deal with things like the uh, Black Death, the bubonic plague. It hits in 1347 AD, it hits in spurts from 1347 to 1400. Uh, we deal with the film Black Panther. Black Panther is deep. And Black Panther uh, deals with, relates to African history, African culture, African language, African spiritual systems. The film Black Panther. This is uh, Mansa Musa, became emperor of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD. There's an article from history.com, official website of the History Channel, that shows a connection between. Massa Musa and T'Challa, T'Challa, who's the Black Panther. Uh, in the vast fictional universe of Marvel Comics, T'Challa, best known uh, as Black Panther, is not only the king of Wakanda, he's also the richest superhero of them all. Although uh, although today's fight for the title of wealthiest person alive involves a tug of war between billionaire CEO, CEOs, the wealthiest person in history, Massa Musa, has more in common with Marvel's first black superhero. OK, the uh, wealthiest person in history, Massa Musa, has more in common with Marvel's first black superhero. Now, some people may say, well, I'm too busy to take the class. Like, like I said, we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived. You can go back and watch it anytime. If you can go and watch the class next year, or if you have to watch the class at two in the morning or something like that, you can do this. You don't have to be present in the class. And it's not like a Zoom call. So we don't see like everybody on the screen. You see me, I can't see you. We, we have a live text chat in the class. Um, so you can ask questions, but you don't have to worry about me seeing you, you can be in your pajamas or what have you. you. You don't have to worry about getting dressed up, doing your hair, anything like that <laughs> for class. I don't take attendance. All right. So it's, it's, you don't have to worry about that. Um, Mansa Musa became ruler of the Mali empire in 1312 AD. Okay. And the, I mean, you, you're going to, you'll hear a lot of stories about, um, uh, about Massa Musa and on his hajj to Mecca 
he gives out so much gold that he throws off the economies of, of the different cities that he's going through. Um, so he became emperor of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD after his predecessor, Abu Bakir II, for whom he had served as deputy, went missing on a voyage he took by sea to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean. Mansa Musa's rule came at a time. Now, this is something extremely important, this part right here. Now, this is the History Channel telling you this, okay? Mansa Musa's rule came at a time when European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources. West Africa is thriving. Europe is in, is in disarray. Europe is ravaged by civil wars. Europe is dealing with poverty. They're still dealing with ignorance. Even though when the Moors go in the 711 AD, 85 to 90% of Europeans are illiterate and, they, and they're teaching them to read and write. And they're teaching them mathematics. They're teaching them algebra, chemistry. Uh, everything we taught the Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. When we study this history, everything we taught them came back to kick us in the behind. Um, during that period, the Mali Empire flourished thanks to ample natural resources like gold and salt. You read this full article here from history.com. This 14th century African emperor remains the richest person in history. Okay. This is from March 19th, 2018. So this was, this, this was the month after the movie uh, Black Panther officially debuted. It debuted uh, February 16th. 2018 I, i've done a i do an entire lecture dealing with the uh film black panther so one of the things we deal with in the class also is the film black panther and how uh black panther relates to uh african history and african culture african language we deal with what the word wakanda means even though wakanda is a fictitious uh african nation somewhere in east africa and over the years, the location has changed some. Um, Wakanda is a real word. Wakanda, we see Wakanda in Native American languages, Omaha, Ponca, and Sioux Indian languages. Uh, Wakanda means possesses secret powers. Okay. So this is deep. In, and Wakanda is also a key Congo word as well. It's a Bantu word but it's, it's it's in uh it's a key congo word also is is african as well so it, 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 I, I did about three months of research on the film black panther on the comic book uh because i have a lecture that's about almost three hours dealing with the film and, and how it relates to african history culture spiritual systems different aspect of it and I had to do, I read about a hundred articles dealing with the film and the comic book. And um, the the more I researched, the more questions I had. I read two books dealing with it because I had to, you know, had, had watching the movie. So at the time the movie came out, I think I'd been studying history, maybe 26, 28 years, something like that. And doing lectures and doing African History Network show. But I knew that um i wasn't qualified to like really talk about the movie i had to like do some deep research to understand what it was i was seeing okay so i read um um where is that two two books that i read this one right here this deals with the 52 year history of the black panther comic book because i had to study the black panther comic book and some storylines and characters because we see that a lot of that represented in the film so i had to read this book by marvel black panther the ultimate guide and the scene where uh t'challa right here the scene where um Killmonger throws T'Challa off the waterfall. That's straight out the comic book. That's from uh, September 1973, Jungle Action Comics number six. And the waterfall is called Warrior Falls. Warrior Falls is where the 
ritual combat takes place historically to determine who's going to sit on the throne of Wakanda. That's called Warrior Falls. So in the beginning of the movie, when T'Challa is fighting against Mbaku of the Jabari tribe, and there are 18 different tribes that make up Wakanda. So Wakanda is a nation, but it's made up of 18 different tribes also. The, the, the Crocodile tribe, the, the uh, Jabari tribe, and, and each tribe has their uh, own deity um, as well. Okay, so we see Best, uh, we see Bastet, Bass or Bastet is the panther deity, okay, that watches over the people of Wakanda. Just like when you study in ancient Kemet, there were deities that watched over different cities. In Christianity, that becomes the patron saints. Patron saints are saints that are said to watch over different cities or different nations of people or different groups of people. So St. Nicholas, who the, uh, may have the children, St. Nicholas, who the character of Santa Claus is based upon, was actually an African saint, third, fourth century African saint. And he's said to be a patron saint of uh, children, pawnbrokers, money lenders, prostitutes, uh, seamen, th those in like the Navy out at sea, things like this. OK, you have patron saints in Christianity. The patron saints are going to replace the Netaru. OK, uh, so here's Bast or Bastet, who was a deity, a Netar in ancient Kemet. Ancient Egyptian goddess worshipped in the form of a lioness and later a cat, goddess of warfare in lower Kemet, lower Egypt, worshipped as early as the second dynasty, 2890 BCE, approximately before the common era. So, I mean, the, the movie is so deep, but so we deal with we in the class, we do with how that movie relates to African history and culture, ancient Kemet, things like this. Um, we talk about the Black Death. So if we go back here and look at some other things that we deal with in the class. Um, the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors and the Moors are taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe. And these are going to be teachings that bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. Um, we look at shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything, the role insurance companies played and how insurance companies uh, took out insurance policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations, Freemasonry in America, the origins of the term America and Africa, uh, and more. The Black Death, bubonic plague, 1347. Hits and spurts from 1347 to 1400. One of the worst plagues in history arrived at Europe's shores in 1347 Common Era AD. Five years later, some 25 to 50 million people were dead. Nearly uh, 700 years, nearly 700 years after the Black Death swept through Europe, it still ha haunts the world as the worst case scenario for an epidemic called the Great Mortality as it caused its devastation, the second great pandemic of the bubonic plague became known as the black death in the late 17th century europe is going to lose between a quarter to a third of its population because of the black death over from 1347 to about 1400 they lose somewhere between um 20 estimates of somewhere between 25 million to 75 million people the black the, the black death and what it does what it did was it liquefied your uh, lungs. So you, over the course of a number of days, would end up coughing up your lungs and coughing up blood. Okay, so uh, now band two. Okay, band two is a group of African, about 500 African languages belonging to the Bantoid subgroup of the Banu uh, Congo branch of the Niger. Congo language family. The Bantu languages are spoken in a very large area, including most of Africa from southern uh, Cameroon eastward to Kenya and southward to the southernmost tip of the continent, southernmost tip of the continent of Africa, including South Africa. 
12 Bantu languages are spoken by more than 5 million people, including Rundi, Rwanda, Shona, Kosa, or Isi Kosa, and Zulu or Amazulu. Swahili or Kiswahili, which is spoken by 5 million people as a mother tongue and some 30 million as a second language, is a Bantu lingua franca important in both commerce and literature. So the word Kwanzaa is a Kiswahili word. Kiswahili is a Bantu language. The language spoken in the film Black Panther is called Isi Kosa. Isi Kosa is a Bantu language as well. That's a real African language that they spoke in the film Black Panther. So we do, we'll do well, what is Wakanda and all this and how this all relates to African history as, as well. So you talk about Christopher Columbus, where Columbus went on his four voyages. Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. OK, which is something very, very important to note. Um, and I still hear people say when Columbus came here, when Columbus came here and different things like this, you know, no, Columbus never came to this land. Um, his first voyage, August 3rd, 1492, um, he set sail on the Nina, the Penta and the Santa Maria. He goes into, uh, the Bahamas. He goes into, uh, Cuba, Hispaniola. And we know on the island of Hispaniola, we, you have, uh, Haiti on that island. Yes. Uh, Dominican Republic in Haiti. Um, he goes his second voyage, 1493, he goes into the West Indies. He goes in Puerto Rico, uh, Jamaica, 1494. Third voyage, uh, May 1498, goes into Trinidad and Ven Venezuelan mainland. Fourth voyage, May 1504, he goes into Panama and Honduras in Central America. If you go to history.com, official website of the History Channel, search for Christopher Columbus. They have a lot of information there and they show you where he went on his voyages. He never came to the land that we call the United States of America. OK, um, so we go through and do a lot of this and we take you through a timeline of history and we deal it, it, as well as the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors, which is a critical history to understanding the the, the origins of the transatlantic slave trade. What happened right before the transatlantic slave trade started? People, a lot of people mistakenly think that uh when the transatlantic slave trade starts this is the first time europeans came in contact with african people no they, they were dealing with africans for hundreds of years in europe we talk about what the middle passage was and break down the triangular trade and, and all of this okay all right so this is um and then we know the wakanda salute comes out of ancient kemet that is the position of the nasubiti he's always right over left it's always right over left that's the position of the Nisubiti or the, or the or the pharaohs when they're deceased. OK, and it's a position of power. And we see that go around the world also. OK, so you can um, this class is ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. That's just a very brief overview of uh, the classes, a 10 week online course that I teach. This class uh, will be on Sundays. 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, starting October 3rd. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are recorded. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. Even after the 10-week class is over, you can go back and watch it. So you don't have to worry if, well, I don't have time to be in class on a particular day or something like that. That's not a problem. You can use this information also with your children. If you like, I would say the information is PG-13. I don't do a lot of cursing. It's not overly graphic. It's, you know, it's not crazy. So you can use this with your children as well. Um, as soon as you, so the class is regularly $130 is on sale, $80. As soon as you register, there's some bonus content that you can start watching. You get a bonus lecture from me, which is a lecture I did dealing with the real history of Juneteenth. Okay. Uh, the real history of Juneteenth is a two and a half hour lecture. I did that, uh, june of 2021 all right okay so and okay you get that and okay oh the other class 
that I teach is the second class is from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power, 1865 to 1968. This class picks up basically where understanding the transatlantic slave trade leaves off. Okay. Uh, so if you want to register for this class as well, you can register for that. That's uh, on Saturdays, 12 noon to 2 PM Eastern standard time. And so as soon as you register, you can watch the class we just did this past weekend of, uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. That's a fantastic class as well. Each class we go through and analyze approximately a 10 year period of history to see what happened after slavery ends. And we deal with some of the history leading up to the Civil War as well. All right, so register uh, for those classes and uh, we'll see you in class and also be sure to listen to uh, my show and watch my show, the African History Network show on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Standard Time and Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we broadcast on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. But uh, you can also uh, listen on the iHeartRadio app, download the iHeartRadio app, search for 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. You can listen live there and then uh, the audio podcast on my shows are on iHeartRadio as well. iHeartRadio, iTunes, CastBox, Stitcher. Just search for the African History Network show. But we broadcast the show live as well on Facebook and YouTube, the African History Network on uh, Facebook and Michael M. Hotep on YouTube. OK, lastly, uh, if you want to support the African History Network uh, beyond the classes, you can support us through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App and also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So, so let's keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Uh, this is our official cash app account, dollar sign, the AHN show, S-H-O-W. And when you go to it, it'll uh, show my name. It'll say Michael and show my picture there. Um, these other ones here are fake African History Network cash app accounts. So that is not me, okay? These other ones here are fake African History Network cash app accounts. All right. So, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, thanks for joining us. Give us a thumbs up if you like this uh, broadcast, if you like this information. Hopefully we'll see you in class. Remember, the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.